Hi friends, welcome back to Faith and Arrow Homestead. My name is Jaylee and today I'm doing something a little different. Let me know if you like this. I wanted to put together an affordable weekly menu for you. Um, this video was actually my mom's idea and I really liked it with inflation and everything going on right now. I know that there are so many people interested in healthy um, eating, but are intimidated by it because of the prices of food right now. And so I wanted to come to you with some uh, recipe ideas and some tips and tricks and just kind of show you, hey, even if you are on a budget, you can still um, cook from scratch and create healthy nourishing meals for your family. Um, I did the shopping at Walmart because I tried to keep it um, so that everybody could participate. If I went somewhere like Wegmans, that's only here in Northern America, um, I feel like that wouldn't be quite so fair. Uh, so I chose Walmart. I want to, before we go over the grocery list, I do want to say that I know that these ingredients are not the best of the best. Um, that's not the point of this video. If you want to get down to the nitty gritty and talk real good quality food ingredients, we can have that conversation. But the point of this video was to just say, hey, if you're on a really tight budget, you can still make this happen. And there's good, better, best. Um, I want to say that this is in the good, better category, not quite best. Um, but you're still going to be nourishing your family so much more than if you just gave up and got Taco Bell. You know what I mean? So I really want this video to be encouraging. Um, and then also I'm going to go ahead and give you the menu. I don't um, make everything on this menu in this video because this video would be super long if I did that. Um, but I will try to have at least the recipes for everything down in the description of this video. So the menu for breakfast, I have um, baked oatmeal, pancakes and omelets. Um, I just put PB&J grilled cheese for lunches. I don't really make very many lunches. Tom gets smoothies and then I oftentimes will just eat leftovers or I'll make a sandwich like I just said. And then for dinner we have chicken parmesan casserole, chicken pot pie, chicken and rice, sweet potato and eggs. And then um, I also encourage you, although I don't go over it in this video, um, to make your own bread at home. I will have a recipe linked down in the description for you to take a stab at it. So um, I didn't really do snacks, I didn't really do lunches, um, but there are still some really excellent recipes in this video and it's a great place to start. So let's go ahead and go shopping. I actually took my camera with me to Walmart and I um, kind of cross-referenced because I put together a shopping list and I looked up all of the prices online um, just to get a ballpark idea for what this menu was going to cost. And then I kind of compared it in person to what I was actually finding at Walmart. So for starters, we've got onions. I needed two of them. They were 98 cents a pound. So I paid about 78 cents a piece um, for those onions. Then we have a bag of sweet potatoes. These sweet potatoes cost, uh, let's see, $5.48. Then I bought a one pound bag of carrots. Those cost a dollar eight. And we got, just for snacks, some organic bananas. I like bananas as a snack. They're very affordable. Those were just 72 cents each for that bundle. Next, we have the most important ingredient in this shopping trip, and that is a whole chicken. Yes, I am going to encourage you to cook a whole chicken for this weekly menu. Most of these recipes actually are chicken-based. And so here we've got um, just a Purdue whole chicken. I don't even think they're organic. Again, I realize that not all of these ingredients are the best of the best, but you are still going to be doing better for your family by cooking a whole chicken, even a non-organic one, than going and getting taken out and getting something fried. So I still recommend this even though these particular chickens, they're affordable, they're not organic, I still recommend doing it. We need a couple dozen eggs for the week. These organic eggs are $3.93 a package and we are going to pick up two of these. Next we need some milk. They had a few different organic milk options. I ended up going with this grass-fed milk and it's $5.24. We also need some butter. Um, I actually, I don't mind Organic Valley's products. They're not the best, but they're okay. Um, and so I did pick up one of these Organic Valley um, organic butters. Next, we need some maple syrup. Maple syrup is one of those that I actually don't care too much if they're organic because maple syrup comes from trees. <laughs> and so I just, I have this like funny idea of somebody walking around spraying trees. I just don't know if that's a thing. 
um, and maybe I'm just uninformed on the matter, but I don't necessarily purchase organic maple syrup. Um, however, I do make sure that what I am buying is true maple syrup because a lot of those syrups that you see at the store are actually just um, sugary syrups labeled as maple flavored. They are not actually maple syrups. So keep an eye out for that. Next, we need some flour. Um, before I was really into healthy eating, I actually would purchase this unbleached all-purpose flour from King Arthur. This option is not organic, but it is unbleached. So I do think it's a good place to start if you are being really, really careful about your budget. But Walmart did also have this organic option that was a couple dollars more. We need to get some yeast. I really struggled with the rice. I walked around for a um, couple minutes and looked at all the different rice options before finally settling on this jasmine rice. Um, and even then I didn't, I thought the price was pretty high. I get my rice typically from Azure Standard, but again, I was trying to keep this really fair for everybody. Didn't, didn't love the options for rice. Um, and I definitely do like to get an organic rice. We also need an organic uh, pasta sauce or a marinara sauce. Organic peanut butter for those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I also really struggled with the jam. The jam and the rice were the two things I struggled with the most. I was getting pretty upset because this was a lot of marketing propaganda with these jellies. I was seeing a lot of the word natural um, and it was just, there was nothing natural about what I was seeing and it was pretty upsetting. So these um, strawberry preserves are most likely what I would purchase. Um, but I was not I was not thrilled with the options. Next, we need some organic oats for that oatmeal bake, and then we need some um, organic vegetables for that chicken pot pie. As you see here, they had a few different options, and they had one organic option. Kind of up to you. When it comes to frozen veggies that I'm going to eat one time in a chicken pot pie, this would be a place that I would cut. A corner and purchase something non-organic um, but at the same time you can see that there's really only like what is that like 75 cents difference so it just depends on what your goals are but they did have an organic mi mixed vegetable option and then they didn't have the price listed for this organic um, block of sharp cheddar cheese but I believe I paid two dollars and 37 cents that's what I have written down here and then I noticed um, when I was going back over everything, trying to make sure that I had covered all my bases, that I actually left off breadcrumbs. Um, we do need a bag of breadcrumbs, and they have just plain breadcrumbs on their website for $1.22. Um, they were non-organic. Again, probably a place that I would cut a corner. Um, also, fun fact, you can make your own breadcrumbs really easily. Um, if you are going to make bread, you could just take the ends of the bread um, bake them at a low temperature for a few minutes and then crumble them up and you can use breadcrumbs that way if you don't want to purchase them or you're really really tight on funds. Okay so my goal was to keep this menu under $80 because I, I imagine somebody on a really tight budget probably has about $100 a week budgeted and I, this clearly did not include any toiletries or anything like that. And then also I didn't really factor in snacks either. Um, I, don't, I didn't include any recipes for snacks in this video. So I wanted to leave a little bit of leeway. So um, this shopping list came to $77 and 95 cents. So that was what I was able to accomplish for this. I know it's not perfect, um, but I wanted to come and try to be practical and give you guys some practical tips and ideas. So we are actually going to start off by cooking that chicken and in doing so, we're also going to make some broth and we'll be using both of those things for a lot of these recipes. What you need, a stock pot, a heavy bottomed pot, and I've got my chicken right here. It's, it was in the freezer and I took it out. You have to take it out a couple of days in advance if you're gonna let it thaw in the fridge because it takes a while. And I'm just gonna put that right in here. And then here I've got a couple of carrots and I just like, I always leave them pretty chunky. You don't have to like dice them very small or anything. And I'm gonna put those in there. And then I've got a couple of onions here that I'm just going to quarter, nothing special. There is no exact amount of vegetable. It depends on what you have, what you're going for. Some people don't add vegetable to their chicken stock. 
I always just go based off of what I have. Um, and I have carrots and onions. You can also add celery. Now we're going to take our big pot with our chicken and our vegetables over to the sink. And we are going to put at, add enough water to cover everything. So that's not quite halfway filled, almost halfway filled. Now chicken broth is very customizable. I only used one chicken, it's just Tom and I, and I can accomplish all of the meals that we're going to make with just the one chicken. If you're a larger family, you may need two or three chickens, and that's totally fine. Everything that I said still applies. You would just add more water to cover all of those chickens, right? So right now I have that, um, all the heat all the way up to high. I'm gonna bring it up to a boil. I'm gonna reduce the temperature to a simmer, and I'm gonna let it simmer for two hours, somewhere between an hour and a half to two hours. If you have more than one chicken, it might take a little longer. I've honestly only ever done one chicken, so use your discretion there, but an hour and a half to two hours, I remove the chicken. I have a big cutting board. You're gonna see all of this. I remove all the meat and I put the bones and all the random bits back and I let it simmer all day long. Now here's the thing. In terms of the amount of chickens, you can add however many chickens you need. In terms of the amount of water, if you are really, really on a budget and you're really trying to stretch this, you can add more water and you'll end up with more broth in the end. It will just be thinner and not as flavorful, but you can still use it. And if you think about it, like for example, we're gonna be cooking rice in broth, you're still getting more nutrition using your thin chicken broth than if you just used water. So it's still beneficial. And if you're really trying to stretch a dollar here, you can add more water to get a thinner broth. Um, or if obviously if you have less water, you'll have a more concentrated broth. The other thing is the cooking time. I'm going to let this simmer all day long. It's eight o'clock in the morning and I'm going to let it go until dinner time. Uh, maybe even I might just remove what I need for dinner and let it keep going past dinner time. The longer you let it go, cook, simmer, the more concentrated, the more nutrition is going to get pulled out of those bones. I know some people who put it in, um, roasting ovens and let it go overnight. It, there's so many different things you can do. Chicken broth, any kind of broth, is very versatile and very uh, open to interpretation. You can individualize it to your needs. All right, here's what I like to do. This chicken has been simmering away for actually a little over two hours because I've been, do I've been busy doing other stuff. Um, so it's definitely ready. You don't want to let it go. I turned it on low, so it's fine, but you don't want to leave it for too long because it will change the texture of the chicken that you're gonna eat. Um, so I have my big cutting board here. I've got two pairs of tongs. This is how I do it. These are my big tongs. They're actually my husband's. And I like to try and get the body of the chicken. And then I use the smaller ones kind of as supporting tongs. And I try to lift the whole thing out in one go, but it's gonna fall apart on you. So I don't usually get it all at once if I'm being honest. And then I come in and I just kind of fish out the parts that dropped. Now, once you get all your chicken out, you can put your broth right back on the burner. It's already looking so good. Um, this needs to cool because what we're gonna do is pick all of the chicken off of the bones and put all the bones and whatnot back. This is way too hot to handle. So that's why, because you could leave this here you're going to want to put all of that stuff, so it would be easier to have it here to put all the stuff back in it, but I wanna get this back simmering again. So instead of letting it sit here and waiting for it all to cool, I'm just gonna go ahead and get this, I'm just gonna go ahead and get this back on the stove. Okay, so what we ended up with, I've got my bowl of chicken here, and then I've got, all of the scrap bits that are going to go into the pot. So into the pot, all of our scraps go. And then I want you to add a splash of apple cider vinegar to your broth because this helps pull all of that nutrition out of the bones. All right, friends, I have the first recipe for you, but before we get into it, I just wanted to say that I'm having such a nice time. I know that some people really look at cooking as like something uh, that they 
begrudge or like really don't look forward to doing. They don't like being in the kitchen. They don't like cooking. Um, and, and everybody's personality is different, but it just brings me so much joy. I'm in the kitchen right now that I might look familiar because I am also in the process of making apple butter right now and I'm filming that video today, but I really have to get dinner going and I'm in the process of doing this healthy cooking on a budget video. So I need to film what I'm making for dinner tonight. And that sounds like a lot and it is, it's so much work. I've got so many things going. I've got the dishes I'm going to have to do tonight. Yeah, it's a lot, but it brings me so much joy because I've got a loaf of bread, sourdough bread proofing over here. I have a, a Dutch oven full of apples simmering away on the stove. It smells so good in here. And I am about to put together a chicken pot pie for dinner. And guys, what about that does not just sound absolutely amazing. I just love everything about it. So here I have uh, two small onions uh, diced. I've got a couple of carrots diced and I've got two cloves of garlic diced. Um, whatever combination of that, you could also do celery, however much onion, however little onion. When it comes to vegetables, I don't like to tell you what to do because it's really what you prefer. And then I have a fourth a cup of butter here. We're going to take this over to my cast iron skillet and we're going to start sauteing that. So I'm going to start by getting my cast iron skillet warming up here. I know the lighting is not great. It's getting dark outside, so my face isn't very lit up, but you don't need to see my face. I'm gonna go ahead and put that fourth a cup of butter into my skillet and I'm gonna let that start to melt. All right, my butter is melted and decently warm and I'm just gonna go ahead and add my onion, carrot, and garlic right in there. I did just go ahead and add some salt, maybe about a teaspoon. I add the salt in the beginning of me cooking my vegetables. Uh, some people like to add the salt way later in the dish. I add it right in the beginning when I add my vegetables and butter into my skillet to saute because during the cooking process, the salt really permeates the cellular membrane of the vegetable, really gets in there. It helps draw out some of that moisture um, and it just adds, the flavor is better, I think, when the salt has had time to cook with the vegetables versus adding it, in which case it's just kind of layered on top. This way the salt and the veggies really Mm, Mary and it's delicious. All right, so I let that go. I give it the occasional stir. It's got plenty of butter and the salt's gonna help add even more liquid. It's fine to just hang out on the stove. I um, turned it down to like a medium low temperature. I'll give it the occasional stir, but we're gonna move on to the biscuits. So we're going to make an easy drop biscuit. This recipe is on my website and it's absolutely one of my favorite biscuit recipes and it's my favorite way to make um, chicken pot pie because traditionally it has like a pie crust, I use biscuits instead. And this has kind of morphed over time because back when I first started using biscuits, I buy the cans of biscuits from the grocery store and they're full of junk and preservatives and unnecessary. These biscuits are so easy to make and so delicious with a chicken pot pie. So here in this bowl, I have 290 grams of flour. Um, I, I made this recipe, so unfortunately I have not looked to see how that um, converts to cups and all-purpose flour, but I do know it's 290 grams. I wanna go ahead and put out a disclaimer because I know many of you are new followers to my channel. I really, 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 really recommend that you buy a kitchen scale. This baby, $11 on Amazon. I'll link it down in the description. It is so easy to use. It's a workhorse. I use this scale nearly every day and it makes things so much easier because if you prefer recipes that are in cups, that's fine. Please continue to use those. But if you come across a recipe that's in grams, it gives you, it, it, it just opens up your ability. It, it allows you to create more recipes instead of limiting you to only ones that are listed in cups. So 290 grams of flour in this bowl here. To this bowl of flour, we're going to add one tablespoon of baking powder, one teaspoon of sugar, and one teaspoon of salt. I'm just going to use my whisk here to combine these dry ingredients. Now this recipe calls for one stick of butter melted. And I always like to go ahead and prepare that before I move on to my wet ingredients. So naturally I didn't take this out of the fridge ahead of time or anything like that. I just stick it into a, a glass measuring cup and stick it in the microwave the old fashioned way. 
Now these drop biscuits are actually sourdough drop biscuits. However, I realize not all of you um, are into sourdough, have a sourdough starter, what have you. So all you need to do is follow this recipe exactly and just omit the sourdough starter. Nothing changes because we are not relying on the sourdough starter as a leavening agent. We are using the baking powder and it is what gives these biscuits its rise. So the sourdough starter doesn't actually do anything except provide additional flavor and nutrition. So I like to include sourdough whenever I can, but you don't have to for this recipe. Also, because the sourdough does not provide any leavening qualities, it does not matter if it's active sourdough or if it's sourdough discard. This is not particularly active. I only fed it a couple of hours ago. I have bread going back here. And so that's just fine. It's no big deal at all. So we want 115 grams of sourdough starter. So I've got my bowl of flour here and my scale is zeroed out and I'm just going to add 115 grams. That was 115 grams perfectly, awesome. I'm also gonna go ahead and add in my um, melted butter. That was half a cup or one stick. And then we're also gonna go ahead and add three fourths a cup of milk. We're just gonna go ahead and get these ingredients mixed together here. This is also a good opportunity to add a little extra flavor to your chicken pot pie if you wanna add if you wanna add any herbs or any flavorings, garlic powder, rosemary, thyme, oregano, you could, whatever you wanna do. If you wanna make it a little spicy, you could even add some red chili flakes, you know. I always like to try and encourage you guys to think outside the box. So the biscuits that go on top of the chicken pot pie are a great opportunity to zhuzh it up a little bit if that's what you wanna do. So all it takes is just a couple passes. This mixes together really easy, it's a one bowl uh, biscuit recipe and then we're just gonna let that hang out and come back over to the stove. Do you see how much liquid is down in the bottom of this? That is perfect. It's exactly what we need because the next step is to add one third a cup of flour and I like to just sprinkle a little bit of it in and whisk it around. You can, you can add the whole thing in if you want to. This one's not as big of a deal. I'm just so used to doing it all in stages to make it nice and smooth. And then you need to let this cook for a minute because you wanna cook out the flavor of the flour. So we're just gonna let this go for a minute. All of this in the bottom of the pan will brown slightly and add a wonderful depth of flavor. But you wanna keep it moving because you don't want anything to burn. And I've got this on medium low heat. After about a minute, I'm gonna start adding my liquid. Here I have a cup and a half of milk and I'm gonna add it a little at a time. If you watched my um, cream of chicken soup video, this is very similar. And I can't say this for sure, but I imagine there are probably recipes, uh, chicken pot pie recipes out there that aren't quite so homemade that call for cream of chicken soup. I would imagine that that is probably one of the ingredients in a less homemade chicken pot pie recipe. And that's basically what we're doing here is making cream of chicken soup. Now, as you can see, this is looking thinner than my cream of chicken soup looked. The cream of chicken soup was very, very thick and this is already thinner and we have more liquid to add. However, I like my chicken pot pie filling to be thinner than simply cream of chicken soup because we are also going to put this in the oven and it's going to thicken up even more in the oven and having the biscuits on top, um, take some of the moisture out of the filling. And so I like it to be on the thinner side, but you can adjust the liquid measurements in this recipe to give you a filling that is the thickness that you desire. So we just added a cup and a half of milk. Next, we're going to add two cups 
of chicken broth. Now this is probably not quite two cups. Uh, after we made the chicken broth together, Tom and I had to go out of town. So I froze all of the chicken broth in pint sized jars. And I took this one out a couple of days ago to thaw in the fridge. It is probably not quite two cups, but remember the measurements in this recipe don't have to be exact. If I only have a cup and a half of chicken broth, I'm still going to end up with a perfectly acceptable chicken pot pie filling. So you've got a little wiggle room on this one. So all of our liquid has been added. And as you can see, this is rather thin, right? It's a lot thinner than the cream of chicken soup, but that's okay because I've got it on just a little bit above low and it's gonna keep simmering. At this point, there are three things that I like to add to this. The first is pepper and I add quite a bit of pepper. I really like my chicken pot pie to be a little peppery. The next is frozen peas. I just continually take them out of the same bag. So I just take it right out of the freezer. They're frozen and I don't love peas, so I don't add a ton but I do add a few. Honestly, I just do it because I feel like, I feel like chicken pot pie is supposed to have peas. And then last, I add the chicken. And this always has the chance to simmer a little longer and thicken up a little bit more because I always store my chicken in really big pieces after cooking up that whole chicken. So I stand here for a good five minutes and contemplate life and shred chicken. <laughs> this is one of those situations where you need to be cognizant of what you're making for the week because this bowl of chicken is all the chicken I have for all of these meals that we're making this week. So I have to be really aware of how much chicken I'm putting into the pot pie. And honestly, guys, this would still be a delicious meal even if there was no chicken. Um, so sometimes I go really light on the chicken. Sometimes I'm able to go real heavy on the chicken. It really just depends on what I need and what I'm trying to do that week. And for this one, I'm probably going to do somewhere in the middle. I'm not going to go super light, but I'm not going to go heavy either because we do have other chicken recipes that we are making this week. And I like my chicken to be shredded up into tiny little bits. At this point, I'd say you can go ahead and preheat your oven to 425. And then the last thing, and this is completely optional. Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. I'm gonna little, add a little bit of cheese. This is a white cheddar that I had just a little bit left of in the fridge that I really needed to use up. Honestly, it was just a little bit, not a lot at all. Sometimes I don't add cheese to it. Sometimes I do, it just, I don't know, depends on how I'm feeling and what I have in the fridge. And I'm gonna go ahead and add that at this point. And I'm gonna turn that heat off because this is done and we are ready to put it all together. How about we give this a taste before we put it into our baking dish? I love chicken pot pie because I feel like it is just the epitome of a homemade meal. It's got that really warm, hearty, healthy flavor and I just absolutely love it. Very, very good. It's perfect the way it is. Hey, honey, leave that. So before anybody asks, this adorable dish is from Pioneer Woman, and this is what I always make my chicken pot pie in. And so we are just going to put our filling right in there. I don't do anything to prepare this dish. I don't ever have any issues with anything sticking. And then once I put it in there, I do mix it around a little because sometimes I notice the chicken can tend to, when it comes out, maybe because it's heavier than the other stuff, it like clumps in the middle. So I move it around a little bit just to make sure that it's like evenly dispersed throughout the filling. And then the last step, this is so easy, you guys. You've got your biscuit dough over here that you have already made. It's ready to go. It's just been hanging out while you made your filling. I just like to take it and it's usually a little sticky, but it's, it's you can work with it. And I just like to shape it so like I made a corner here, so I'm gonna set that right in the corner. And it sinks a little, but for the most part, it stays right on the surface and is pretty easy to cover your filling. So here's a great example of being cognizant of the size of pan that you use or casserole dish or whatever. 
that you choose to make this in because I'm always trying to get you guys to think about, I don't like to give you sizes of pans or dishes because I want you to figure it out for yourself. So here's a great example. I have my uh, chicken pot pie totally covered with biscuit dough and I still have a ton of biscuit dough. So that tells me I could put this in a more shallow, bigger dish and I would have more room to cover it with the biscuits and I would therefore end up with more ultimately. Um, perhaps not calorically, but serving wise, I would be able to scoop out more each time. So if I was feeding a big family, then I would probably put this in like a, a regular sized casserole dish because I've got plenty of biscuit dough to cover that. Um, and instead, I always use this dish. I honestly don't even know why now that we're talking about it. I just always gravitated towards this one. So I just go through and do a second layer of uh, the biscuit dough and I go through, cause there are little spots here where the filling is peeking through. So I just go through and do a second layer and it's it always cooks through for me. It's biscuit dough, it, it cooks really easily. It may take a few extra minutes for me versus if you had it just in one single layer in a bigger dish. Um, but this is a great example of using your critical thinking skills to figure out what you want to do because it depends like are you feeding a bunch of people i'm only feeding my husband and i so this small chicken pot pie right here is going to feed us for two nights i don't need more than that um, but if you need it a lot you could do a bigger dish and it just helps you to think what are my needs what do i have what supplies do i have what dishes do i even have and how can i go about this another creative opportunity this is ready to go right in the oven you've got your biscuit dough right on top here you could melt some butter and put in a little garlic powder, a little shredded cheddar. You could put that on top for some added flavor. That would be delicious. I have done that before. I'm not gonna do it today, uh, but just another opportunity for you to kind of be creative. I'm gonna go ahead and get this in my preheated 425 degree oven. So again, your baking time depends on um, do you have a single layer of biscuit dough? Do you have a thin layer of biscuit dough? You're just looking for that to be browned. Um, when you're making the biscuits, the biscuit dough as biscuits, I say 10 to 14 minutes. So I'm gonna check that probably around eight minutes and see and if it's starting to get kind of golden brown on top, then it's done. All right, you guys, here's what we're working with here. So good, oh my gosh. And we're gonna try it together even though I know it's delicious because I've made this dozens of times. I always just use a spoon to scoop some out that mm. but here is a really tasty bite this is what it looks like I mean it's nothing to look at I definitely like realize that but oh so tasty mm. those biscuits are cooked through perfectly I'm in the process of also filming the apple butter video, so I forgot about it in the oven. So it was in there for probably, if I had to, I don't even know how long, like 15, 16 minutes. But the biscuits are very forgiving, so they're not, obviously they're not burnt, right? All right, you guys, there's one super affordable, really easy homemade meal that you can make for your family that is not only going to taste good, but is going to be so nourishing to them. I'll see you next time we're in the kitchen. All right, we are moving on to the next dinner. This, honestly, these last two dinners are options that are really fast and really easy, and I did that on purpose because usually by the end of the week, I'm really tired and I don't have that much energy to put into cooking. So we're going to make a chicken Parmesan casserole. Um, and I've actually made this in another video, but it's been a long time. It's not a recent one. So I'm gonna take our cooked chicken and I'm going to dice it. And as I'm cutting it, I'm just going to throw it into our dish here. Now, here's the thing about these recipes at this point in the week, because remember, we're still cooking with that one chicken that we cooked and made the broth out of. And so I just have one layer of chicken in the bottom of this dish. We still have one more meal to make out of this chicken. So we've got a couple little hunks left, and this is it. This is all I have for dinner for these next two nights. And my handsome Tom is so sweet and understanding because I've made these two, 
what we're making tonight and what I'm going to show you tomorrow night, I've made in conjunction before and there's very little chicken sometimes and he eats it and he does not complain. He's very sweet. Something that you could add to this to beef it up tonight is noodles or rice. We're not going to um, because we're, I'm going to serve it with toast. I just wanted to point out that it's okay if you don't have a ton of chicken. There are other ways to work around it. I've just got one layer of chunked chicken down here and that's fine. So the next thing we're going to do is add our sauce, our, 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 just a jar of marinara sauce. And you're just going to add that right on top. And then I like to get that all, you can just leave it like that, but I do like to mix it pretty well. Get the chicken really coated in the sauce. And then here we have shredded up our cheese. And so we're just going to sprinkle that right on top here. I've done it both ways. I've done it where I've mixed it in with the chicken and the uh, marinara. And I've also done it where it's just layered on top. And I've never noticed really much of a difference in the experience of eating it. So it's just easier to layer it on top. So that's what I'm gonna do. Here I've got four tablespoons of butter. I'm gonna get that in a microwave safe bowl and we're going to melt that butter. All right, I've got that, those four tablespoons of butter melted. I've got one cup of breadcrumbs here. And then if that's all you have, this is fine. Or if you have some table salt, that's fine. I don't wanna pressure you because this is kind of a, a, on a budget cooking um, video, but I like to add a little garlic salt. I've got these minced onions. I actually just picked this up from Aldi's. It was 99 cents. Not organic, but sometimes you just do the best you can do. And then I've got some oregano here that I'm going to add. If you have just like a generic Italian seasoning from the store, that would also go really well with this. And we're just gonna get this mixed together. Oh, by the way, preheat your oven to 350 degrees. All right, these look great and they smell great. And then on top of our, so we've got our chicken with the marinara, we've got our shredded cheese on top, our grated cheese, and we are just going to sprinkle our breadcrumb mixture as evenly as we can over the top of all of that. And doesn't that look delicious? So we're gonna go ahead and get this in our preheated 350 degree oven and we're gonna bake it for about 20 minutes. Just keep an eye on it. You want the top to be golden and bubbly. Here we go. Does that not just look amazing? It's bubbly, it smells incredible. This is gonna be a very yummy dinner and very affordable. So when we eat chicken Parmesan casserole, I usually serve it with a piece of buttered toast. And then the way that I like to eat it, I'll scoop some, like I'll have obviously my serving on my plate and I'll scoop a little bit onto the piece of toast and I'll eat that bite of toast. Does anybody else like to do that? I do it with all of my pasta dishes. I always eat it off of my piece of toast. So that's how I serve this piece of buttered toast. And that's it, that's dinner. And it's delicious, it's filling enough. It's not super filling, but it's filling enough to get the job done. And it's very, very affordable. So I'll see you guys the next time we're in the kitchen. All right, we are back in the kitchen, but on this day, I was incredibly busy. So I'm having to do a voiceover for this because I literally didn't even have time to talk to the camera for this. We're gonna start by preparing some rice. Just prepare your rice however your package instructs you to. The only difference is instead of using water, I always make my rice using chicken broth. It adds so much more flavor and nutrition versus just using water. So here you just see me preparing my rice. All right, now that my rice is finished, we're going to add in the rest of that chicken. I diced it up a little bit into nice bite-sized pieces, and I'm adding that into the rice that I just cooked. I'm going to add a little bit of pepper. You can add whatever herbs or seasonings you want. Normally, I add more broth into it, um, but this was the very last bit of our broth that we made together. That was it. I like it to be more soupy than this, but I didn't have enough broth. So here you see me adding a little bit of butter to just try and get a little bit more um, moisture in there. And that's it. Doesn't that look delicious? So easy. I mean, it literally just takes a few minutes to put this together and it's hearty and it's filling, but it's incredibly affordable and it's still very delicious.
All right, friends, it is the very last day of this video and we are making what I like to call a cheat meal and I call it that because it is just unbelievably easy to put together and only a couple of ingredients, but it's still so nourishing, which was the whole point of this video. I wanted you to be able to nourish your family on a budget with affordable meals. And so this one is just simply sweet potato and eggs. Um, I like to make it a bit of a scramble, um, but there are different ways you can do it and we're gonna talk about that. For starters, we have sweet potatoes. Now sweet potatoes are actually very nourishing. They have a lot of vitamin A. Um, but the way that you cook it impacts how much of the various um, nutrients you will receive. And actually roasting them gives you the least amount of nutrition, but it also makes them the tastiest that way, and isn't that just the way it goes? Boiling them with the skins on gives you the most nutrients. I'm mentioning this to you because I have tried to make sure that you get the most bang for your buck and so cooking them by boiling them with the skins on um, and then cutting them and scooping out the flesh is going to give you the most nutrients and you can very easily um, uh, put them in boiling water boil them for about 20-25 minutes turn the heat off let them sit in the water for another 10 minutes cut them scoop out the flesh um, and then you can just throw it in. If you're scrambling eggs, you can throw it in there and kind of scramble it together. You could mix it into your cooked eggs afterwards. You can serve it on the side, um, but that's going to give you the most nutrient um, bioavailability. I like to roast them. I like the flavor better and just the whole ex eating experience better with roasted sweet potatoes. So that's what I'm gonna show you, but I wanted to make sure that you had all the information so that you can make your own, your own choices here. So I've got the oven preheating to 425 degrees. I already washed my sweet potato. I'm gonna peel it and then I'm going to dice it. All right, I've got my sweet potato. Oh, oven's preheated. I've got my sweet potato all cubed up. And all I'm gonna do is add in a splash of olive oil, a little bit of salt, and a little bit of pepper. And then I'm just gonna give it a little shake to try and really coat the sweet potato. And then I just take a baking sheet and it doesn't usually stick too bad for me because it's coated in the olive oil. So I don't usually do anything to prepare my baking sheet. You can if you um, usually have issues with food sticking on whatever baking sheet you use. And then I'm going to bake these at 425 for 10 minutes. And then at the 10 minute mark, I take them out and I use a spatula to just kind of like flip them over and move them around a little bit. And then I usually bake them for another 10 to 15 minutes. It kind of depends on how big you made your chunks and how roasted you really want them. Here are our roasted sweet potatoes. I roast mine pretty good. Um, I like them crunchy. Um, and so I roast mine. They were probably in there for 25 minutes altogether. Um, and there are so many different things that you can do with them now with what we're about to do. Let me give you some ideas. So the first idea, and what I'm actually going to do, is make them into an egg scramble. So here I have two eggs. I get these, I got these eggs from the same farm that I get my the milk from because my girls are not laying really at all right now, unfortunately. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of milk. I just opened this, so if I try to turn it and pour it, it's not going to work. So I'm just gonna spoon a little bit of milk in here. I definitely, if you have not been adding milk to your scrambled eggs, start doing it. It makes them so fluffy. And that's all I'm going to add. Normally I would add like a little salt and pepper, maybe a little garlic salt. I already have salt and pepper on my sweet potatoes. And I don't know, I'm not really in the mood for anything else. I think I'm just gonna keep it really simple this time. And I'm just kind of giving these a quick whisk. And then I'm going to add a nice handful of my sweet potatoes right in there with my eggs. And I'm going to fry this up over on my cast iron skillet. And here we've got a beautiful bowl of sweet potato egg scramble, I guess. I also oftentimes will roast the sweet potatoes the same way that I did. And I'll fry two eggs, sunny side up or over easy, and put them on top of the sweet potato. And that way the yolk gets on them. Mm -mm -mm, so good. But I was in the mood for a scramble. Um, I'm probably going to get a piece of toast with some butter on it and eat it that way. Um, 
in in the past when I've had more money in the budget and can be a little bougier, I've done um, avocado with taco sauce and it's almost like it would be really good in a burrito. Mm, so good. Um, when I make this and give it to Tom, he smothers it in ketchup. So there are so many different ways that you can dress this up. Oh, I also have before added breakfast sausage to this and that's been really good too. So there's so many different things that you can do to dress it up. But the point is eggs and sweet potatoes and that's pretty much it. And you have a hearty, delicious, healthy, nourishing meal that you can feed your family. And that was the point of this video. And in closing, because this is it, this was the last recipe, we're finished here. I just wanted to tell you guys, I wanted to encourage you because if you've been following me, if you've listened to my last handful of videos, it's been really tight around here. My budget, it's rough. There's been a couple of weeks that I haven't been able to go grocery shopping at all. I haven't had any money for it. Um, and so it has caused, it has created a situation where I've had to get really creative and I, I have, and I'm still feeding Tom and I um, healthy meals. I'm still sticking to my no seed oils. We're not eating out. I'm finding ways to get food on the table and situations like that kind of force you to be creative. However, I've already been living this lifestyle. So I think it's really easy for me to be like, oh yeah, I'm having, you know, a tough couple of months. I've already got all these skills and all this knowledge and this backup of ingredients that I can fall back on. So I wanted to come to you and say, if you're new to this, if you're wanting to get into a nourishing lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle, but you're on a budget, you can do it. There are ways. Um, and I think I'm probably going to put out a couple more videos like this in the future. It just took a little bit of planning and I'm sure that this video is gonna be a little chaotic because it was actually kind of difficult to do, but I think information like this is really valuable to people and that's what I want this channel to be. I genuinely really wanna help you get healthy meals on the table for your family. So thanks so much for watching. I'm gonna try and have as much of this down in the description as I can. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. I appreciate you guys so much and I can't wait to see you in my next video. Have faith, my friends and keep moving forward.